Hello everyone and thanks for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul and you're watching my short video called Responding to Sources. So just as a brief review, we've been talking uh, in my class and in some of these videos about the concept of they say, I say, uh, developed by Birkenstein and Graf in their textbook. And the basic is that we're using what other people say as a launching pad for your own ideas. That is, you're thinking about writing as part of a conversation in which you're taking part. So we started off with talking about uh, as a way just to get yourself started, as a way to launch into a topic broadly, responding to popular ideas, responding to ideas that many people hold. So we had things like many people assume that state governments contribute a significant amount to the budgets of their state colleges. This is only partially true. While government contributions are still significant, the overall total has decreased by about 9 billion over the last 10 years. So introducing a common view and uh, then a contrast to it. When I was a child, I used to think that the good guys always win. Experience has taught me a harsh lesson. That is rarely the case in the real world. So talking about it when I was a child, but using uh, this broad view and using my own experience as a stand-in for um, a common experience that many people have had. Although none of them have ever said so directly, my students have given me the impression that they are scared of their professors. I hope this isn't the case. Most professors are quite friendly and want to talk with their students. So again, an idea, popular idea that's implicit and responding to it, using that as the starting point to express my own thoughts. After we talked about uh, general ideas, responding to broad ideas that aren't necessarily ascribable to an individual, then we talked about specific, using specific ideas from specific individuals, framing and explaining quotations, the importance of introducing a quotation and then after you uh, give the other author's words that you're going to respond to, you explain what they're saying. So for example, in his book, De Bono's Thinking Course, Cognitive scientist Edward de Bono maintains that we need to break loose of the notion that critical thinking is sufficient or we shall never pay sufficient attention to the creative, constructive, and design aspects of thinking. So that's the introduction. I'm framing it, saying who it's from and where it's from, and then the quotation itself. And I could even give more explanation before why uh, putting this in the context of whatever my argument is, whatever I'm writing about. And then the other side of framing it is explaining it. In making this comment, de Bono urges us to acknowledge the limits of traditional logical thinking, particularly when it comes to generating new ideas. The critical mode of thinking looks at a problem and attempts to solve it in the most direct way, etc., etc. And this is to indicate that uh, explaining is not necessarily just a one sentence thing, depending on the complexity of the idea that you're introducing. It may take uh, a little while, it may be a, a, an extended process of explaining the author's ideas. So, assuming that you've introduced a topic, there's a conversation that you're taking part in, in your writing, and you've introduced in, in some general way your attitude, your position on that topic, later on in your writing, you start engaging with other voices, other ideas, the, the writings of other authors, whether they are there to support or extend or even challenge your argument. So it's not just a matter then of explaining the quotations and the ideas that you're using from other voices, you also have to respond. And so there are three basic ways of responding. Yes, no, and a little bit of both. Agreement, disagreement, or partial agreement and disagreement. Now three, there's an asterisk there because of course there's an infinite number of ways you can respond to uh, another person's ideas. And there's a whole continuum of agreement and disagreement. These aren't discrete, uh, three discrete separable positions. There's a, there's a continuum between them, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but they do form the basis of the basic ways one can respond. And most important is this because all three, whether or not you're agreeing or disagreeing with someone, if you're taking part in a conversation as a writer, it's your uh, duty. It's, it's on, you have the, the obligation to explain your reasoning. Why do you agree? Why do you disagree? So that because is key in this process. Speaking of keys, let's review some of the key elements to successfully engaging in a written academic conversation. Uh, framing, right? Distinguishing between what they say and what you say. And when you're responding to a particular author, to particular ideas that you've introduced, 
uh, it's really important, uh, your earlier framing is really important that you have been throughout showing the different participants in the conversation. So it must be clear what they think uh, in order to understand your position. So framing is extremely important when responding and of course uh, throughout the paper and building to the point where you are starting to engage directly with other voices. Fairly and accurately representing what other people say. Uh, so avoiding things like misquoting them or co quoting someone out of context, falsely attributing words to someone that they didn't say, or twisting their words, taking them out of context to, or using them to mean something that they obviously didn't mean. So all those sorts of things you want to avoid. Those are um, either mistakes or they're unethical behavior. It's an attempt at manipulation. So fairly and accurately representing other people's voices, especially when they disagree with you, is a way to demonstrate not only your understanding of their ideas, but also your honesty and your ethics as a writer, and it makes you more trustworthy. Relevancy, of course, whenever you are quoting from someone or engaging with someone else's ideas, it should be appropriate, it should be relevant to your topic. They should be talking about something that engages with what you're writing about, and you need to make that clear. Similarly, you need to engage with the source. If you're responding to someone, you, what you're responding to is what they said. It's relevant to what they're actually talking about and not some other issue. And this is also part of the issue of fairly and accurately representing what other people say. And finally, uh, very important, as I mentioned before, reasons. When you're responding to someone else, you explain their ideas clearly. You give evidence to support what, what it is that you think they believe, and you give reasons for your response, whether that's agreement, disagreement, whatever, explaining it, not just saying, this is what I think, but this is what I think and why. Let's now look at some examples of these three different modes of responding. First, agreeing with reasons. Right, so here's a couple of examples of two of the templates that Berkstein and, and Graf use in their textbook um, that are a way to introduce or explain that you agree with someone. Sigmund Freud's theory of the unconscious is extremely useful because it sheds light on the difficult problem of why people behave in ways they themselves do not understand. So I've introduced the idea that I agree with and then said why it's useful, what it is that I get from that idea. Uh, another example, those unfamiliar with this school of thought will be interested to know that it basically boils down to the idea that we should consider all people as our neighbors and part of the same community. So summing up an idea for people, presenting it in a kind of a, a small micro capsule form uh, as a way to make it easily understandable. It doesn't explicitly say anything about agreement, but just the, I think the framing of it, um, the way it's trying to make something familiar as in something that's that's good, that you're familiar with, that feels familiar or comfortable. So this is these are two simple examples of the idea of just how to agree uh, by with some simple explanation, simple reasons of why you agree with the, the ideas, what you think is valuable about them. Disagreeing with reasons. So same thing. Now these are basic ways to uh, explain the idea, introduce the idea that you disagree with and give a brief explanation of why. So Kanye West's claim that he will win the presidency in 2024 rests upon the questionable assumption that just because many people like his music, they will also trust him to run an entire nation and have access to nuclear weapons. So rests upon the questionable assumption. This is a very subtle way of saying that you think someone's argument is wrong, that one of their assumptions, something that they believe as part of their argument is questionable, is not uh, sturdy, so to speak. Meredith Brooke contradicts herself. On the one hand, she argues, I'm a sinner. On the other hand, she also says, I'm a saint. So here, if there's a contradiction in, in someone's idea, you're explaining, well, this is why I don't think this person's argument is sound or why we should uh, question something, something about their conclusion. They contradict themselves. They introduce things that appear to, that seem to be uh, incommensurable, that seem to be opposed to one another in the same argument. So that's why I disagree. That's the reason behind my disagreement. Both of these notice they're fairly subtle. They're not saying such and such is, is wrong even. They're not saying such and such is an idiot, anything like that. It's just, this is the reason why I do not think their conclusion is 100%. And 
agreeing and disagreeing simultaneously, which is probably the most common way we, we uh, really engage with most people and most other ideas. Uh, we often find at least something that we can agree with, even if we mostly disagree. And even if there's someone, say a politician, that we really side with a lot on most of their issues, there's always going to be one thing that we disagree with. So these are this is really these are really useful templates, I think. Uh, although I disagree with much that Christopher Wallace says, I fully endorse his final conclusion that more money generally leads to more problems. So yes, I have problems with a lot of, of this person's argument or their perspective, but I do think that ultimately they come to the right answer. They may come to it through the wrong way, and there may be other things that we disagree with, what to do about the problem, et cetera, et cetera, but I do agree with their ultimate conclusion. Right, politicians, especially politicians of the same party in primary season, this is these are the kind of things they say. Well, I disagree with such and such as policies, but I do agree that that uh, unemployment is a serious issue. I just think we have different ways of of solving it. Right, though I concede that the possibility aliens have visited Earth cannot be completely ruled out. I still insist that there's no evidence or reason to believe it has happened. So. I'm conceding something is possible, yes, but I'm also asserting the idea that uh, this possibility is very, sm is very small, that um, ultimately I don't buy the conclusion, I don't buy the argument, I think the reasons for it are weak. So both of these, notice also how um, they have uh, uh, different emphases. One is a little bit more uh, emphasis on what, we ag what I agree with, the second one is a little bit more emphasis on what I disagree with. So that idea of a continuum you can see in these two different examples. A few really important points. One, the templates are just the starting point. That is, as I said before, when explaining a quotation, when explaining your reasons for agreeing or disagreeing with an idea, most of the time it's gonna take more than just one sentence or part of a sentence. Usually if you're writing, especially if you're writing about a, an important or complex or involved subject, you're gonna require either further evidence and explanation of your source's ideas so that your readers can understand them and or you're going to need further evidence and explanation of your response why you agree or disagree and the more complex the ideas that you're that you're responding to and the more uh involved your reasons for disagreeing uh, the more you're going to have to explain and this is something that you'll find as you get further and further into a discipline or field that you're studying it requires more and more explanation to uh, often even to correct just simple errors because there's so much that you have to go through just to get to the point of understanding why a certain question is wrong or a certain issue is is more complicated than it may seem. So most of the time you're going to have to do more than just say, I disagree because of this one reason or I agree because of this one reason. Even beyond the idea that the templates are not the starting point, the templates aren't the point themselves at all. It's not about this particular wording that you say according to such and such or uh, such and such is useful because it sheds light on, right? The wording and the form can be endlessly modified. You can change these, you can transform the language to fit any number of situations, to be more formal, to be less formal, to be... Um, to fit in different disciplines, to uh, change the verbs out in terms of describing what an author is doing, whether they are arguing or complaining or asserting or celebrating or urging, right? All those sorts of things can be changed endlessly, infinitely to suit the writing situation. So it's not the templates that are the point. What's really the point are the habits of thinking and writing that you do these, that you get in the habit of doing this so it becomes part of the way that you think about writing, part of the way that you think about thinking as a conversation, writing in conversation with other people. You're not just ranting uh, on your blog about what you think is going on with the aliens and FBI or whatever, but you're in conversation with other people and you're distinguishing between the different voices and ideas. We know where you stand, we know where other people stand, and we know where you stand on other people's stances. Uh, so that framing, introducing, saying where you get your ideas from or where a source is from, saying who is saying, uh, uh, explaining who they are and why they are a valuable or credible source, and then explaining what they mean. 
explaining your response, giving reasons to understand why you think or do a certain thing or believe a, 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 a certain way or agree or disagree, right? So it's these habits of thinking that are most important. So whenever you're writing, think about why am I writing this? What's the conversation that I'm taking part in? Who am I responding to? And then what are the different people participating in, in, and making sure that you know what you think versus what someone else thinks, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, again, always framing, explaining, not just throwing things in, but preparing your reader and helping your, your reader understand how what you've written, uh, how what you've quoted or paraphrased fits in with the overall topic. And finally, uh, as I said earlier, there's a continuum of agreement and disagreement. It's not just 100% agree, 100% disagree, or 50-50. So as you're writing, and again, this is something to, to always be aware of, to get in the habit of thinking this way, uh, modify your diction and your tone to suit the level of accord or discord between your ideas and the ideas that you're referring to or quoting. Um, so you change it if you, if you strongly agree, then that should be expressed if you strongly disagree or if it's more nuanced. Uh, and so when you're doing the agreeing or disagreeing, when you're saying that there's part of someone's argument that you think is valid or valuable, and there's another part of it that you don't think is so strong, consider the relative emphasis. Is it mostly agree, mostly disagree? And what do you want to stress to your readers? Are you trying to stress your disagreement with someone? Uh, or are you trying to stress your agreement with them? Right. Again, in uh, uh, politics, someone might try to stress how much they agree with someone in their own party, even if there are other uh, uh, differences between them, while they might stress how much they disagree with someone of the other party, even if they have significant uh, overlaps. And finally, whether you're agreeing, disagreeing, whatever, avoid positive and neg or negative hyperbole, real extreme language. Avoid, you know, attacking someone's character, being insulting, uh, referring to something as, uh, you know, be being demeaning about someone's ideas. Um, as much as possible, try to be generous uh, even when disagreeing. All right, now let's talk about how we can practice this skill, how we can get better at uh, responding to our sources and explaining our, our positions. So an exercise that anyone can do, first step is just to find a piece of writing that makes an argument. Now, there's all sorts of things that we could draw from. If you're a student, especially, you probably have all sorts of assignments, uh, but a few good, good options here. One, op-eds from local or national news agencies, and I've given links here to the New York Times, Washington Post, NPR, their opinion sections. Um, so you'll have people here, both experts and not experts, uh, presenting their arguments on certain subjects, controversial, important subjects of the day. Procon.org is not uh, a news agency, but they do collect uh, lots of different articles on controversial subjects presenting the different perspectives. So that's those are some good places uh, to find uh, arguments. Famous quotations, right? Many famous quotations are mini arguments, someone defining something or making some proclamation about uh, love or some other aspect of life. So Bartlett's quotations, bartlettsquotes.com is the most famous one and that's available on all sorts of social media platforms. They have apps and Twitter feeds and all that. So that, that's a good place to find uh, short pithy arguments that you might respond to. And speech databases, uh, AmericanRhetoric.com has a number of political speeches, presidential speeches, uh, just all sorts of important historical speeches from US history. Uh, and those, of course, are gonna have a lot of good arguments or a lot of good ideas that you can respond to. So finding something that makes an argument, a strong argument that you can respond to, whether it's agreeing, disagreeing, or, or a little bit of both. And as you're reading the source, whatever you've chosen, identify the author's major claims. And now the author's claims are not just their thesis, not just their overall argument or their, their main point that they're trying to get across. It also includes the reasons that they're using to support that argument and the way they interpret evidence. 
all these are things that you want to uh, identify as potential places where you might agree or disagree. You might disagree with an author about what the uh, meaning is of a certain survey, of what it tells us about um, people's attitudes. You might agree uh, or disagree with their reasoning uh, for supporting a particular policy. So it's not just the main claim, but all these other subclaims, parts of their argument that they have to develop, any of those can be something that you examine and take issue with. And then locate yourself on the continuum of agreement and disagreement with this author and, and the various claims. Which do you find most persuasive? Which do you find least, least persuasive? And can you explain your reasonings one way or the other? And it's very important to, to pick ideas and claims to respond to that you actually can explain why. If it's just something that makes you angry or makes you happy and you have no uh, uh, ability to explain why that is, then that's not a good claim to respond to. Right? Um, and after reading the source, what is your overall position on the topic? Has it changed? Have they persuaded you in any way? Can you explain why? So this is, these are all some questions to ask in order to, as I said, identify yourself or locate, locate yourself on the continuum of agreement and disagreement. So you can determine how much and to what extent and what specifically do you agree or disagree with in the author's ideas. And then finally, uh, writing responses. So write a response where you explain the author's position, your position, and why you agree or disagree. And it's good to start with relatively simple ideas and, and short, uh, short responses. So things that are relatively clear that require minimal explanation. So minor elements in someone's argument, things that you don't have a, a huge d disagreement or agreement on. Then you can build to longer responses and, and more complex ideas. These are ones where you need more evidence to explain uh, either their idea or your response or both. And then ultimately the goal is that you could write a complex point by point response to another author, whether it's a political piece or a philosophical piece or whatever. Um, if you can go through and, and engage with their entire argument and explain why you agree or disagree um, with each of their major claims and interpretations, that shows a real thorough understanding and engagement with their ideas. And it's also, it's not just about learning what they say, it's a way to develop your ideas in detail. Really the core of the whole they say, I say philosophy is that we can't really know what we want to say until we, or what we think, until we have the opportunity to respond to someone else's ideas. Now, for those of you who are my students, um, the research exercise, and there's more details on Blackboard, but the basic, uh, the basic steps are one, select one of the articles and, or sources that you found in the process of researching your topic this semester. Uh, and review the article, look for the author's most significant claims. What is it, the most important ideas that they wish to prove their most significant interpretations? And make a list of these important provocative and controversial claims from the article. And as you are doing so, mark down whether you agree, disagree, partially agree, partially disagree. Try to uh, put jot down some notes about your thoughts. And again, locate yourself on the continuum of agreement and disagreement. And then step five, or excuse me, step four, choose five of the claims made by the source um, whether they're major claims or uh, uh, particular interpretations of uh, individual evidence. They can come from, um, you, should, you should use the claims, use the templates to write a short response explaining why you agree, disagree, or partially agree and partially disagree. Be sure to identify the original source and reproduce the author's idea exactly as it is written, that is if you're quoting directly from the source, or if you're not quoting directly, uh, that you provide an accurate paraphrase. So. Basically, you're going to pick five ideas that this author is trying to prove or wants you to, uh, uh, to believe and explain your response to them, whether you think they are correct, incorrect, and why. Right? So important here, the most important thing is that it's not just a one sentence, I agree because X, but that you go into some detail explaining your agreement or disagreement. So here's a sample response. Uh, I took it from this article, Male Violence is Everywhere by Michael Reichart. Uh, and there's a link to it on the Atlantic. And the claim, this is uh, what Michael Reichart says. He, he writes, 
quote, social conventions impel boys to move on, be strong, suck it up. And uh, my position is that I agree partially with this claim, but I think there are exceptions to it. So I've picked this template. I'm of two minds about the claim. On the one hand, I agree. On the other hand, I'm not sure if. So this is the, the first part of, uh, uh, of the process. I've gone through, found a claim that they're trying to make and identified my, myself on the continuum. And now I'm gonna write my actual response. So here's uh, the response. I'm not going to read it out, but basically the idea is, yes, I, I do agree that that these are traditional ideas that um, uh, are still very popular uh, and still very prevalent in the way we raise boys. Uh, on the other hand, I'm not sure if they're still universal and I give some reasons why. So it's not just on the one hand, I agree. On the other hand, I'm not sure that this is still true. I then explain why I partially agree and disagree. So this is a, an example of how you might respond to a claim from your own article, from one of your own sources. So just a final review. The ideas here, again, important to always distinguish between voices and ideas, between what you're saying and what they say. Fair and accurate representation of your source's ideas. When you're quoting someone or paraphrasing or summarizing them, that you're being accurate, you're being fair, you're not mischaracterizing them. Uh, of course, that the source and the response are relevant and appropriate. Whatever you're drawing from is relevant to your topic, and however you're responding to it is relevant to what they're actually saying. And then, of course, that you provide a clear explanation. This has really been the key in this video, a clear explanation of what you think about their ideas, and you give reasons. You explain it. Uh, uh, you don't just say, I agree, but you provide support. So that's the end. Uh, if you have any questions, there's my email. Um, feel free to email me, comment on the video. Otherwise, I hope to see you in the next video or in class. Have a great rest of your day.